Welcome to A Professor's Life, your fortnightly podcast for all things academia. I am Chris. With me tonight is Stephen. Stephen is here. And Robert. And I'm the static picture. If you're watching us, yes, you'll you'll notice that Robert doesn't move a lot. He is very, very, <laughs> very boring. I'm Zen, man. Ah. For those of you on audio only, the experience should be the same. <laughs> <laughs> Zen, but equally boring. Yes. <laughs> all right, so we, we're back after a bit of a break as we've all got things taken care of in our various personal lives. And so we're coming back to you with a new show of a professor's life. And we thought this week we would take uh, on a topic that's very near and dear to Robert's heart right now. And that is what they call onboarding. For those of you that are listening to audio, air quotes around onboarding. Because <laughs> this is a new term for me. So better than probably, waterboarding, but yes, go ahead. It is better than waterboarding. It's better than a lot, but it's not better than surfboarding, I bet. Fair enough. Yeah. So, Robert, yes. since you are the most uh, experienced on boarder that we Actually, have. I'm not. Uh, this is my second academic position, and uh, each of you have had at least two. Oh, I guess that's true. Yeah. Yeah, but it sounds like you've had more of an adventure on onboarding oh god <laughs> keep seeing the damn air quotes um yeah because even though uh you guys can't see my video i can see their video um so i can make offensive gestures that you can't see anyway uh so so starting a new position uh i'm having a very different experience this time than the last time the last time it was just come in sign some paperwork they told me how much it it was worth if I lost like a thumb. Oh, just this very creepy talk with HR I had uh, when I came into Penn State. They kept telling me what my digits were worth. You know, if you lose one thumb, you know, if you lose two thumbs, if you go blind, just like why are you telling me this? Um, then they had me sign some intellectual property agreements, and that was about it. Uh, but for the new gig. Um, I'm just talking about the formal stuff. Then I think we should get into the informal stuff with the new job later. Uh, sure. Because I'm doing that significantly better than last time. <laughs> last time it was just like, ooh, I'm new, yay. Um, so this time, go in, sign some forms. Uh, then I start getting emails for background checks, and you know, because that's all the thing now. So I do all the stuff, the background checks, and then they have a series of compliance trainings. Uh, for FERPA, got to do that one. Uh, no drugs in the workplace training, uh, sexual harassment training, some IRB training. Uh, there's all these little various compliance things. Oh, how to properly dispose of hazardous waste. That was a that was a whole little module. Um, so take all your plutonium and figure out where you want to put it. That's interesting because you know I've done hazardous waste stuff for being in a science department. And I know art professors who have had to do these things. So, you know, you're disposing of paints or whatever. But you? Why you? <laughs> uh, it's uh, <laughs> it's one, one size fits all. Oh, um, okay. Everybody's okay. got to do it. And uh, the FERPA one was the most important one, you know, the, uh, the privacy one mm -hmm. for students. Mm -hmm. Always. Mainly, I had to do that one before I could get access to most of the uh, online systems. Um, I have way more access than I previously had. I mean, I can get into student records now mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. see grades and things mm -hmm. that before we didn't have access to. University by university, heavily yeah, different. Yeah. Very different. Yeah. Um, and that training took quite a while because they want to make sure you really know what you can and cannot do given the level of control we have. Mm -hmm. um, but I also found out, and this was different too, um, they actually laughed at me when I asked them. So. This, this will amuse Steven, and Chris will go, what's odd about this? So they said, we're going to sign you up as an advisor for students. And I said, okay. And they said, we generally do that for everybody. Is that okay? Uh, and they re I could get out of it because there's I found out there's a number of things I can get out of because I'm coming in as a chair where they wouldn't give me these extra things to do. Um, but I said, sure. I said, well, wait a minute. What kind of advisor am I? Is this for, like, life advice? <laughs> 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 to which they started like Chris lapping their ass off and you can see Steven shaking his head full like, yeah because that's the, exactly the kind of advisors we were at Penn State you uh, you come in and they faculty 
better not give any kind of advice of what classes to sign up for because we're morons, right? We don't know this this requirement or that requirement. We're going to tell them things that are wrong or to your. I I point. don't actually know what the course numbers are, so I feel comfortable with that assessment. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so we were there to give them advice on like grad school and like life advice. Or or well, we have to you have to add the one other piece on here. We had a uh, very rigid system where you had. A very small window in which you could choose your major so you would enter the business school you were not allowed to actually choose your major until before your junior year and when you click the button of, cho of choose your major you were stuck with that major there was no uh, uh, getting around that and so I actually had a student come in to me and said well um, I, I meant to click marketing and I clicked management by accident uh, so what's the management major about I'm like do you want to be a management major well no I want to be a marketing major but I hit the wrong button and I can't get out of it now Oh no. <laughs> Like, yeah. okay. It was asinine. <laughs> yeah, they've gotten a little less rigid, <laughs> but it's still really hard to switch. So anyway, uh, so it ends up I'm going to be a normal advisor for students, mm -hmm. to which I immediately started to panic because I'm going, I don't even have a course catalog. I have no idea what courses are required. I don't understand the numbering system. I don't even know who teaches the uh, 100 and 200 level courses here because they aren't people in the B school. So how am I supposed to be getting an advice on any of this? Uh, oh, that doesn't matter. They're gonna, you're gonna, you'll slip right into it. It's not hard. You'll after a you know a month or two there of asking, answering questions about what courses are prereq for that. You'll have it all figured out. And there's always <laughs> course cataloging. Look at it's it's not hard. You really can't screw them up unless you wake up in the morning and say, hey, how can I screw the student up? Yeah, well, actually, here I think I probably could because I can't figure out the own. I can't figure out the major. I've gone through the catalog now. It still makes no sense to me. Oh, well, that could like, be a problem. <laughs> uh, I, I can't tell them where to take these courses. I don't know if they're offered. It seems sort of random. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. So I went and then signed up for advisor training. Uh, so wow. I can go get trained as an advisor. Yeah. I'm also tomorrow. I'm taking. I have a training from eight till four, just on benefits, which sounds ridiculous, but there are ten different medical plans. Wow. And I can't figure that crap out. And three different retirement plans. Yeah. And, okay. and once you pick, once you get a single dollar put into one of the retirement plans, you have to be on it for seven years before you can switch. Oh, see, when I was in Kentucky, um, you know, I'm freshly minted PhD, tenure track job, and they didn't even warn me about this. They sat me down, like orientation, hour one, it was like, what retirement plan do you want? Hmm. By the way, once you decide, you can't go back. Yeah, well, and there was two, there was a choice of two. Pension and, or, yeah. Yeah, and I chose poorly because I ended up leaving. I stay, I, I did the pension plan, not knowing what in the world I was doing. Hmm. And But I was told that it, actually the pension plan, the, the Kentucky Teacher Retirement System, is actually quite good. And so if you stay in Kentucky your whole career, it's actually not bad. But if you leave... You lose everything if you're short of 20 years, yeah. Yeah, I, well, I didn't lose everything, but I didn't get the benefits I could have. So... Well, that's state by state too, because I, yeah. when I was at my previous job, it was very clear if you don't spend 20 years, you've punted all the money. Okay. So yeah, I mean, that was, that was an easy decision for me. Um, yeah. pay attention. You also have, yeah, pay attention. You also have, um, both the 403B and a 457 you can go with too. So as a state employee, you have two different plans. Well, okay. That's a different thing here. Here it's a, uh, 401A. Hmm. So I was starting to look into this. The 401A is a lot like a 401K, except you have absolutely no choice how much you contribute. Uh, they choose. The employer chooses, and the employer also chooses your portfolio. Oh, that's terrible. Oh. But the match is significantly higher. It's like a 12% match. <laughs> so... so for our audience listening at home wondering what in the world this has to do with academia, the answer is quite a bit because yeah. you're, not <laughs> told, life, you're, not, you're not prepared for this for graduate school in any way. No. I mean, you get your first job and they plop you down. They start asking you questions about finances. And if you're like me, you enter it totally unprepared for your first job. <laughs> well, again, the big difference is if you've worked for 20 years before you entered academia, then yeah, you've seen this stuff before. But if you come directly out of undergrad or close to it, um, you don't have these choices. You've never made these choices. You have no understanding of what this means. 
Well, and I come from a family who didn't save for retirement because we didn't have any money. All right. So I wouldn't have even heard these numbers from my parents. You could say, well, maybe your parents would say, well, my parents didn't know any of this stuff. No, my parents were pension plan people, so yeah. I mean, I, I didn't, I didn't really understand the four hundred one k thing until my wife was working and she got a four hundred one k. Right, right. So, so is that the basic gist of what you've walked through at this point, Robert? Uh, the formal stuff. That's okay. The formal stuff. Uh, See, most of which the only reason I'm kind of ahead of the game on this is because I went through it before. Okay. I knew there's all these things. I knew I had to go ask people questions. Uh, one thing that I still haven't gotten an answer to. And I think I'm going to have to go to the foundation. So I have a separate fund, right? There's a spending fund that uh, is allocated to me because I hold a chair. I can't find out from anyone in the entire college how I spend it. It's a secret. Which, yes, because they just don't know. Yeah. <laughs> um, because all the other chairs in the college are all held in the college and mine's held in the foundation <laughs> which makes it different and then they laughed at me when i asked who the financial officer was because they don't have one um, you got a new job yeah so i gotta go to the uh university level and go talk to the foundation about this because i want to know how what i can and can't spend my money on and do i just give them a receipt <laughs> and they give me a check uh, I asked if I should get a P card. They all went insane, telling me, no, don't get one. Um, because apparently you have to fill out a bunch of paperwork within two days of the charge, and you have to do it perfect, or you get all these nasty letters. By P card, he means purchasing card, right? Yeah, purchasing card. A card owned by the university, or, so that's through their system, so they take all the risk, essentially. Right, yeah. but your name is on it. Right. So. Yeah, but at my, yeah. at my previous school, that was the easy way to do things. Yes. Right? It yes. actually... The financial officers preferred you to, if you were allowed to have one. Yeah. Uh, preferred you use your P card for everything. Yeah. Because it was automatically tax exempt. You didn't have to worry about asking for it. It was yep. just made life easier. So then we get to the informal stuff. So in this, I think, besides just hey, go out there and make sure you know what you're doing. If you're transitioning between jobs, universities are so damn different. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes arbitrarily different well before we get to that i think we should we should run through the gamut on on the formal stuff yeah um w what i want to trend what want to compare and contrast to that as well as um you know what i did at florida state but let, let's talk about this in general terms you know there's a lot of questions you need to be asking you need to understand the system you need to understand even when you ask these kinds of questions and i think that's part of what you're running into robert is that you're not even sure what questions you need to be asking because you had some experience with this stuff before but then suddenly they're saying well we don't even know what to do so you maybe even have the questions but don't know who to ask those questions of um with my first job again that was straight through i had no experience i didn't like, like chris was saying i had no framework really for even asking certain questions but fortunately at least in terms of retirement and healthcare, my wife had gone through this stuff um, and she, she was gainfully employed and so I actually was able to rely on her uh, but one of the things that I learned very quickly for example was um, they started pay in August for me um, because we had you know one week of the semester in August so I would get a paycheck in August um, however you had to file for your health benefits before that so even though i didn't show up on campus until you know end of july or beginning of august i didn't actually have health care for august because you have to file for it before you even start employment there you had to fill out the paperwork and do all that kind of stuff and they don't tell you that until you go to orientation which was the second week of august so that was kind of awkward. I kind of had to risk, you know, this notion of going a whole month without any health insurance at all and hope for the best. Now, I didn't do anything. I didn't hurt myself. But that was the kind of thing that I had to start telling. Okay, every new hire, guess what? Um, you have to file for health insurance before you actually show up on campus, before you're gainfully employed, before you do this. Call them up and ask for it. And they got surprised every time. You know, we brought in, I think, three employees while I was there and three new employees. And they were, every one of them's like, they called up and they said, well, why would you need to know that? It's like, well, I want to have health insurance my first month there. Oh, you do? Really? That's something that you care about? It's like, <laughs> it was it was this really weird thing that they were surprised by. Um, 
So you have to go through all the things that may be relevant to your life. And this is, you know, I'd ask the senior faculty before you show up on a job, ask them, you know, what are the things that you're encountering? But you also have to be careful. Don't ask the people who've been there for 30 years because people who've been there for 30 years don't actually know the answers at this point. Or it's changed. It's changed, yeah. Yeah. And so, again, going with the, the pension system, you know, I think we're all in that same spot where when we started – the majority of faculty might have been on pension, but by today, very few employees are actually ta- joining the pension system because it's you, you don't think lifetime employment anymore. You don't say, I'm going to stay at this job for the next 30 years. You just don't think that way anymore. Even, even um, in academia. Right. Or, yeah, absolutely. I mean, even in academia, in the culture of hiring for life, right. you, you just don't know what's going to happen five years 10 years. Right. Whatever. Yeah. Uh, I mean, 10 years is a wonderful thing, but, you know, then there's a statement of family. Well, my family wants to be here. I mean, that's that's actually why I moved between jobs. It was that I was moving for my family. I didn't dislike the place. I liked the place I was. I liked the people that I was around, and I moved because of my family. I mean, I remember walking into my, my department chair and saying, you know, I'm going to leave. I took this job. He says, is there anything we can do to, to help you? I said, well, I need to move this university about, you know, several hundred miles to the north. Is that possible? Because uh, otherwise, you can't solve my problem. Um, so you, you have to find the right people and ask these kinds of questions of what are the policies? What are the things I need to know? Cause then when you go to the orientation, yeah, you, you know, Robert, you talked about, you know, this orientation, this orientation, this process, this training and all that stuff. Some of these things are fantastic. Uh, there's great, get, you know, the bigger, the school, the, the more people they hire per year, the better the systems often are, you know, they have a great way of getting to meet people. Uh, my previous job, we all got together, all the new hires for the whole university sat in a room and we went around the room. Who are you? Where were you from before? And tell us something interesting about yourself. And I remember going around this room and then the, the university had a lot of, um, very good performing arts stuff. And so one person talked about, I have nine Grammys or another person talked about how I was the lead French horn on the, uh, star Wars soundtrack. Um, you know, stuff like that. I'm like, Oh, that's kind of interesting. I'm kind of boring, but Hey, cool for you. Um, but that was a good system, you know, where you had some things, you know, formalized because I'd imagine again, the smaller the university, uh, what did you have, Chris? You know, was it like eight people hired that year? Uh, maybe four or five visitings. Okay. So there was a little bit of that icebreaker kind of stuff, but the orientation wasn't nearly as involved with what Roberts is going through, not even mm-hmm. close. Uh, part of that because it's a private school, so there's a little bit less, you know, formality there. Uh, the thing is, though, is that with a smaller school, what starts to become really important is the informal stuff, mm-hmm. right? So, yeah, yeah I, I met people not through the orientation program so much. I mean, I certainly met people through the orientation program. But the real important stuff I learned was going to a party held at somebody else's house mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and having these informal conversations of learning the culture of the particular institution. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, I mean, like I, I, I certainly had more orientation stuff at EKU when I was there at, at the big state school. When I it, at Lake Homing, not nearly as much there uh but personally i didn't need it i'd already been through it i just right, needed right. to know the the way at the new school what's the culture at the new school um, yeah not that i think is almost more important than the formal stuff i mean i'm a month and a half, month and a half yeah a month and a half out from my start date and uh i've already met with half a dozen people i'm setting up lunches and pressing the flesh and mm-hmm. uh so just one quick example of where that's really played in my favor is the whole office game. So, you know, where are they going to put me? So I, so I asked, where are you going to put me? <laughs> um, and mine's a little different situation than most. I'm going to end up with three offices. But my, my departmental faculty college office, uh, I wanted to know where that was going to be. You know, check it out, see what space it was, start thinking about things and see if there was anything I could do to maybe change the furniture or stuff on the way in, because I know sometimes you can't. And I found out that uh, the office they were going to put me in had just gone through some asbestos abatement. Um, Everything had been ripped out. So, I mean, there was no carpet, no furniture, nothing. So I could have whatever I wanted from scratch. So I went and checked that out. It was quite a nice office. Um, But I know that there's, you know, sometimes there's choices. 
right? And the business school here is spread between four buildings. It's kind of this, it's around a, like a quad, mm -hmm. you know, surrounds this quad. Uh, so, I, you know, I'm meeting with the dean, chatting the dean up about programs and stuff. Our little 15-minute meeting turned into being almost three hours. Uh, he started giving me a tour of the buildings, uh, showing me the spaces and stuff. And, you know, there was an office available that I liked. And I said, well, can I have that? And he said, sure. Um, so I ended up moving to a completely different building with a completely different view, totally different setup, um, which I picked because of who was around the, uh, the space. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, it's where there, uh, some of the other uh, entrepreneurship faculty are. A couple of the associate deans are up there. Uh, another one of the chairs is there. There's a conference room right across from my office um, that is, you know, you kind of sign up for so I could have easy access to a conference room. Um, there's parking close by that I can park in, <laughs> you know, which it, it sounds stupid, but no. if you have to walk across campus, you know, yes. in 2000 miles. degrees. Yeah. On the, yeah. On the, the face of the sun. Yeah. Or imagine, you know, back where it snows, yep. you know, mm -hmm. um, but there's also related pieces, which are maybe you don't care because of what your position is coming in. But there's also status signals with some of these things. So you said there's four buildings, and there's a lot of places where there's the old building, there's a newer building, etc. Oh, brand new building. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, there with these kind of situations, picking the correct building makes a difference. Um, you know, it signals who you're a part of, how much do they care about you, or what, where your office is, same deal. You get the corner office. You know, that happened at, at the current university I'm at where somebody got a current corner office only because they asked, well, I didn't like this current location. Is there anything else you can do? Oh, well, yeah, a corner office opened up. Oh, okay, I guess I'll take the corner office. But then it has set of signals associated with it. Um, and anything that can put you into a better position can open up other doors, right? Because now they're in the corner office and they've got this and they've got this other one. And so the people come up and say, oh, can I do this other thing for you? You know, or I'll be more willing to listen to whatever it is. You know, same thing with parking. If you're, you know, getting a parking spot in this deck versus this open lot, maybe that makes a difference. Um, it's so worth asking those kinds of questions. And everyone who comes to meet with you. Yeah. You know, what are they going to pass as they come to where you are? Who will they also see? Mm-hmm. You know, who are you going to be associated with? Right. Um, well, well, exactly. And the thing is, too, is with in academia especially, is uh, it, it's because of these long-standing sort of um, positions that people have had for a long time, mm -hmm. it sort of takes care of itself. It's a, a self-perpetuating thing. And so when you come in, people aren't going to tell you these things. Right. You need to ask these questions. Uh, one of my colleagues took over the basically the control of the, the new faculty guide. <laughs> and what she did was she, you know, every telling people like, you know, you can get your office painted when you show up. I didn't know that. You know, it took me like two years before I found out. Hey, wait, I could, you know, contact the buildings and grounds people and have my office painted because it was three different colors and I was, <laughs> I was looking at three different colors inside. <laughs> it was yellow, brown, and white. And so now it's all polka dotted. Now, yeah, no, now it's a nice blue, <laughs> different blue than what's behind me. But uh, uh, you know, there's these questions, you know, that like about. You know, you found out by accident that you could get this corner office, right? You didn't know you could ask to change offices. Mm -hmm. There's these things. And so you just have to ask. And it's important to become, to know good people early on. Because mm -hmm. if you meet up with those good people early on, then they'll tell you these things. Yeah. Like you can have your office painted or there's a warehouse of furniture and all you have to do is ask for a new desk. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the, the first thing I did, and I did this last time too, and I'd advocate this to everyone. First thing you do, meet the staff. Cause the staff know everything and faculty are morons. Yep, pretty much. Um, and suck up to IT. <laughs> so it's the very first things I did. Go meet the IT guy wherever they wherever IT lives. Go to them. Yeah, wherever that's huge. Staff are, go to them. And most places, the IT are in the basement of some building somewhere. And so actually coming down to the dungeon. Oh, my God. You came down to the dungeon? Interesting. Yeah. It, it, it has an impact. Yeah. Um, then uh, so I was able to order. I've already got my laptop. I haven't even started the job um, because I was nice to the IT guy. So he bumped me up in the queue, uh, got, you know, the system I wanted. He offered to drop it off to me. And I said, no, no, I'll come to you. Mm -hmm. What's convenient for you? Right, this right. kind of stuff. Just little courtesies can make a big difference because most faculty treat them like they're serfs. Makes no yeah. sense. Yeah. 
Yeah, okay. it's you get to know the serv- the uh, staff people, get to know them well, and like you said, that's one of the biggest things you can do is go to them, not expect them to come to you. I mean, this, this is a general human kind of a thing. Be a nice person. Go, be a good person actually has benefits in life is that, you know, you treat people well. They like to treat, you know, they will treat you well in response. It's amazing how there's 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 a lot of this tiered system. And I think there's some of that's a training issue. Is that, you know, people get into the spot, you know, if as a graduate student, you're treated like crap. Right. And some of people, you know, maybe nobody in this room had that experience, but other people who may be listening had that experience. I wasn't even allowed, you know, I, I, not myself, but I've heard stories of other people who uh, grad students weren't allowed in the same door as the faculty. You know, they are metaphorically um, lower tiered because they're actually on lower floors, down in the basement, whatever, in a different building. Um, you know, a friend of mine, they talked about their grad students were all in a building that just got knocked down because it was being condemned. That's where they put all the grad students. It's like, you can't be in the same building as us. You can be in the condemned building. You know, that's the only office you get. Um, you know, in those situations, if you're trained that way, that you are, you know, p- terrible, but when you become faculty, you're wonderful. Well, in that situation, they perhaps walk into a place and they think I should act that same way. That's how I was trained. Right. right? And so they go in there and they start demanding things. And I've seen a lot of faculty who walk in and just start demanding things of the admins. And if you don't treat them well, you know, they can slow things down because the fact of the matter is they're the only ones who understand the bureaucracy. And so if you treat them poorly, they'll just take longer. They send it the wrong way or they don't forward it on to the right person or they put in the code in this thing to this person saying, you know, essentially don't rush on this. Um, Because, you know, again, it's not trying to be a jerk, but... Oh, well, that's the other side of stuff. That's the, you know, if you do good things, they can completely save it. Because as Robert said earlier, we're all stupid. We don't know it. You know, we think we know things and we may know lots of things about our own content area, but we don't know the bureaucracy of the system. And so if you mess up, you know, I I will say on my current job, the first four conferences I went to, I did something wrong. Booked my flight wrong, booked the hotel wrong, reimbursed something wrong, etc. Did something wrong in every one of these spots, and the admins got me out of this. They saved my butt, and eventually now I don't, you know, now four years later or whatever after this time, or five years of not making mistakes, I'm in good shape. But, you know, you mess up. You do things wrong. If you're actually a good human being, they actually respond to that. It's weird advice to give. Don't be an asshole. Oh, okay. Sure. Yeah, but it's advice that has to be given. Yeah, it's advice that has to be given, because... You know, it's, I, I don't know, it's it, like you said, it's a cultural thing, right? I mean, you young girls from a school where you're treated like crap, and then uh, you expect that, you know, well, it's my turn to treat people like crap right, now. Right. That's, that's an awful, awful way to come across. The, secretary, the secretaries especially, the department secretary that can save you, mm-hmm. and they can definitely get in your way. Yeah. And it's just better off to always have them on your side. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And on top of that, other than bureaucracy stuff, Many times they're local to the area. They've yeah. grown up in that particular area. Mm-hmm. So you can ask them for advice like, you know, hey, I'm new and I want to go find a good doctor. Yeah. Or where's a good place to eat? All these things that yeah. you don't think about is because they're not academic related. But the truth of the matter is you got to live in the place that you're working. Well, one of our admins... It, one of our admins knows literally everybody in my town. I, I, I went to somewhere. I was at a conference and I happened to meet somebody at a bar... Not, not from the conference, just somebody at a bar who happened to be from one town over. And I, I was just telling this interesting story and I happened to be telling it to the admin. It's like, oh, okay. Um, was the last name such and such? Like, yeah. Oh, yeah. They're my lawyer. You know, her, her father was my lawyer. I'm like, how? But that's, you know, small town living, which is what I'm currently in. Um, plus having lived in a town for, for 50 years, you know, you just get to know a lot of people and yeah, it's one of those, those communities where they know everybody. So you do things right. If I need something, if I need advice, who do I, I want to go to a, you know, a dietitian. I want to go to a lawyer. I want to go to whoever. I, that's who I ask now are my admins because they know everyone, as Chris said. Yeah, that's already paid dividends for me. One of the also a thing I didn't do last time is start asking people first thing for referrals. Mm-hmm. Mainly because given there are ten freaking medical plans to pick from, I want to make sure whoever the good doctors are, I pick the right damn plan. Right, right. You know, so they're covered. Um, but dentals already paid dividends because uh, my wife had a chipped tooth, mm-hmm. and I had booked. It, it's like, yeah, they said call this people, <laughs> and bam. In there the next day got a referral bonus uh 
uh, which they gave to the person who referred us and to us. Wow. You know, it's got this big discount because someone had referred us. Uh, you know, and great care, very fast. Awesome. What else would you do? Look at the phone book? <laughs> I mean, it's like playing Russian roulette with your life. You know, mm-hmm. at least this first one happened to be dental, a little, little less critical than, you know, a yeah, yeah. health issue, but still. Uh, well, restaurants, yeah. local travel, oh, yeah. museums, all yeah. this stuff. You know, they also tell you all the cool things that you never find out unless you're one of those people that scours the newspaper every single day. Yep. Yeah. You're never going to know that, hey, there's this neat little thing going on for kids your age, mm-hmm. you know, that's free on Tuesdays. So, yeah. so onboarding at a <laughs> new institution, right, is, is more than just getting the right paper so you get your paycheck. You yeah. Know, right, right yeah. That. You're at least in academia, you are becoming part of a culture at the college yep. or institution, right? And you're also becoming part of that local community. You've, you've, you've likely moved somewhere new. Mm-hmm. And so not only are you starting a new job where you have to find out what the rules are of the job, but you have to find out what the rules are of the area. Yeah. You know, and whether that's, you know, who, who doctor, who doctor should you be going to, to how do you get the license plates for your cars? Um, oh, that was a whole nother fiasco. <laughs> well, it always is, right? I mean, no matter where you are in the country, the DMV's a pain in the ass. And so, you know, that's all part of the new job experience in academia. Well, I, I want to build off that last piece too, Chris. Um, the smaller the town and the bigger the university, you know, sort of ratio of university to town, the more the town and gown issues become salient to administration and then it's salient to the town. Um, you know, currently I'm at a place where the vast majority of employees of the town are at the university, some some capacity. Uh, we're the number one employer. The second largest employer is the medical community, the medical center and the hospital. And the third largest employer is Walmart. Um, so it is the university. The university provides everything. And so understanding these town and gown relations, understanding the balance and the community and what people think of each other and what it means to be part of this community, I think is a big thing. And so that's not something you can just pick up and read and, and learn about on the internet or something like that, or a local guide. You really do want to talk to people. And again, this is where the long timers you know, it's here they would say because they, they bleed blue. That's, you know, the, the school colors. And they they literally, um, and by literally, I mean figuratively, uh, <laughs> you know, in this situation, it, it matters so much to them. They're, none of them are Vulcans, so it doesn't come up that way. But it, it – okay. Oh, sorry. I'm not a star. It's not a sci-fi podcast. Fair enough. But it, this, this is a, a – big thing and ask them the questions around what does it mean what what matters here what's the way we define ourselves what's our relationship and there are places where the university and the college or or the university and the town have a great relationship there are places where they have a terrible relationship and you need to know that and understand what that means you know it's if you're walking around here you know having the the sticker of your university or showing your id to some place means something people look more positively to you uh, I, I've heard people at other universities where, you know, they will get pulled over for a parking, uh, I mean, for a speeding ticket, but with the little sticker saying that they've got a parking pass for the university. Oh, okay. You're part of the university. Don't worry about it. You know, we, that, that matters so much to them and other places that may be, ah, you're part of that university. No, we don't want to deal with you and you get extra t- tickets. You're also, you know, harassing me, resisting arrest. Um, so well, ask that questions. There's certain situations too where uh, that are in the middle where it doesn't matter if you're at a school or not because right. you're at a you might be at a small town but you're at an even smaller college, <laughs> right? fair enough and so it's like okay and but that's part of the culture too right or you're a big town but you're new york city and who even knows you know you're one of okay there's twenty thousand people working at the university of a state a uh, city with six million or whatever i mean who cares So, yeah, so uh, onboarding, oh, I forgot the air quotes, onboarding, <laughs> is, uh, is, is a rather complicated subject when it comes to academia, and, and you have to just sort of realize that you're not just, it's not just a new job, it's a new, it's a new life, yeah. really, and, and you have to learn how to sort of fit into how things are being done and, and figure out what the system is, if you will. Well, I think we have uh, come to a pretty good conclusion here on this topic unless there's anything else we'd like to add 
<laughs> uh, now we are going to alt board the show. <laughs> <God>. <laughs> so I'm laughing at the air quotes. <laughs> yes. Uh, thanks again for everyone uh, listening. Uh, follow us on Twitter uh, at Prof Life, and uh, soon we will have this on iTunes. If you're listening to us now on YouTube, we'll hopefully have this stuff up and going. You can listen to us there. Uh, you can probably email us, but uh, email Robert at chatcat.com <laughs> if you have any questions, because I can't remember what the uh, show's... Uh... <laughs> or you can email me. I think I'm Chris at jestercat.com. Or Steven, if you really want to just quit going down that path, sure, why not? If you have questions... Hey, uh, Our name at jestercat.com, problem solved. Yeah. Tweet us, post on Facebook, jestercat. Um, let us know what you'd like us to talk about uh, in terms of the academic sphere. So until next time, everybody, get back to writing. <laughs>